He's climbed the highest points on six of the seven continents of the world and has led a person with a dis disability to the summit of each of those. On May 25th, 2001, Eric Alexander defied the odds and scaled Mount Everest, guiding his blind friend Eric Weinmayer to his 29,000 foot summit. His harrowing adventures are chronicled in his book, The Summit, Faith Beyond Everest's Death Zone. Have a look at this. It's exciting, but it's a uh, discipline to keep your mind focused and, and positive and not just sort of doubting, doubting what you're going to do. I'm fired up. I'm nervous. Uh, no reason. Wow. Okay. Well, Eric well, Alexander is... joins us now on the couch. Welcome to Full Circle. Thanks very much. Thanks I, for letting me share the couch I know. with you. Cut our we, heart well, racing. you know what? If you can do that, you can share the couch with us yes. without any problem. But our hearts are racing oh, yeah. watching that video. Well, it's certainly much more comfortable here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now in your book, you talk about this journey, you know, May of 2001, but you made a comment in your book and you said that cl in climbing, you find something greater than accomplishment. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, there's the camarader camaraderie of mm -hmm. the guys you're climbing with and the friendship and the bond, and I find it actually brings me closer to God. It's, uh, I find myself in need. I'm facing these huge obstacles, and it really puts me down on my knees in, in yeah. prayer, and I get close to the Lord, not because I'm higher in elevation, but uh, just because I, I elevate the need for Him in my life. And yeah. I think, you know, when we have obstacles in our life, it's that same exact thing. Maybe we're up against it, but maybe that's the Lord saying, hey, I'm, I'm here with you, and I want you to seek me out in this and find me in prayer and trust me and have faith. And so, you know, it's more than just the achievement of yeah. climbing. It's all of these things that it brings together. Eric, why in the world would you climb Everest? Like, I'm not a mountain climber that doesn't do something for me, and that's just how I'm at. But why the need or the thrill of the need to climb mountains? Sure. For me, I, I've grown up in Colorado, so I've always been around mountains and high places, and I love climbing. But uh, Everest is the highest of them all. But, it, you know, it's about traveling. You get to go to this beautiful country and meet these interesting people and experience the culture. So it's not just the mountain, but Everest is the highest on earth. And so it's a goal that exists. And then to be able to do it with friends, especially my friend Eric, who's blind, and do it in a unique way is great. And then when you add to that, the fact that people are saying it's impossible, you don't belong, <laughs> you're going to die, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. That alone yeah, would be enough to discourage me. <laughs> that alone that makes point? you want to do, just it. do it. Yeah. Yeah. The we're fascinating thing is that you've wanted to do this since you were a little boy. Yeah. But Everest is usually the pinnacle of a climber's career. Y yeah. You made it your first shot out yeah, of the gate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the odds are against you for doing that too and, and making it to the top on your first try, about 10% of the people, of the 10% that make it, do it on their first attempt. And so for us to do that with someone who's blind was really incredible and I consider it fairly miraculous actually. And he was the first blind person, right, ever to climb Everest? First blind person to try, <laughs> perhaps uh, the first to think of it, <laughs> <laughs> um, but certainly the first to succeed. And his success is due to us just having a good group of guys, a good team that he could rely on. And you know, he was called our weak link, but honestly, throughout this process and looking back, I'd say he was actually the link that kept us together in a way made us stronger. So you need to explain this because mm -hmm. this is such a portrait of the importance of an other's focus. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that ladder, I, I had to ask about that. The Sherpas put that there every season. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're over a great crevasse, aren't you? Like yeah, your death the, is these imminent. Deep you chasms miss? that you can't see the bottom exactly. of even with eyesight. He's blind, he can't see the bottom of any of them, but you know, some of them, they just go to black. 
And so it does take some And it's not for Jesus, but it's the Jesus ladder. Why are they called the <laughs> they Jesus call them, ladder? Well, we had nicknames for different places on the mountain, and one place in particular, we called it the Jesus ladder spot because it was the first word out of one of my teammates' mouths <laughs> <laughs> when he stepped yeah. on it. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you're like, perhaps not worshiping <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, no, no, perhaps. Not, he wasn't a churchgoer. But, um, <laughs> but tell us how that other's focus mm -hmm. helped you overcome the fear of traversing that thing. Yeah, well, honestly, that has really come to mean something else completely to me. I think of the Jesus ladder now as that ladder that spans that chasm that I cannot get across any other way. He laid down his life for us to get across that chasm to, to be with him in eternity. And so that's how I see the Jesus ladder. It was kind of a funny thing when we named it, but uh, it's come to mean so much more. But uh, for me to cross that, when I would turn my focus to my friend who's blind, it became actually easier. I forgot mm -hmm. about my own fears because I was concerned about him and that next step. In Joshua 1.9, the Lord calls us, he called Joshua specifically, to be strong and courageous. It doesn't say anything about fear going away, uh, but if we rely on him and we can be strong and courageous, courage is to move forward in spite of our fears. And when you're focused on someone else, something else, a ministry, serving the needs of others, it's so much easier to do that than to just be totally focused on yourself and what I need to do for my next step. But uh, that allowed us to, to pass through a lot of those obstacles. So what are the challenges? You know, you, so you led the first blind man to, to Everest and, and you know, uh, what percentage of people make it up Everest? So yeah, let's see. Um, like there's a number who die right every year. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. the numbers are, are changing a little bit, and I, have, I don't know the current statistics, but generally for every 10 that summits, one will die. Wow. And okay, so you have yes. 10% chance of dying. Yes. That's kind of big, you know, when you yes. think, am I that special, right. one out of 10? But yeah. what are the challenges specific to taking a blind man up that's a little different than anyone else? It is different because um, the altitude and, and being at that extreme elevation, 26,000 feet is your last camp, and then from there you go on up to the summit 3,000 feet higher. And so there's, there's a lot to consider. You're, you're considering your breathing, your, your extremities, your, your circulation. Uh, you know, you really need to be sensitive to yourself and think of your own needs, but now you add to that someone who's blind, most people would be thinking this is a life and death situation, we need to get this guy down if it happened to any other expedition. But here we are trying to bring him up. <laughs> and so there, there's a lot to consider. How are we going to communicate? Are we going to use radios, special throat mics? Or are, are we going to, well, the, the thing we did is we came up with just a little bear bell that you would use for backpacking. You know, just like in Canada or the mountains in the U.S., you, you use it to scare off the bears, but uh, we would use it for Eric to follow yeah, that sound. Would be so, yeah. so what's the mental state? Like your mind must be, I mean, you have to think about like death and being warm and food, like how, what goes on Plus at that level? you don't level? have enough oxygen, so and you're not thinking clearly, too, right? right? Like you're not thinking at your best. Well, yeah, yeah a lot of times you're, you're, well, most people when they get to that altitude aren't, but I'm just thankful to the Lord. I, I felt just like I did at home and wow. uh, I don't attribute that to any strength that, that I had but to a certain strength he gave me on that day. Um, I was able to get to 26,000 feet without supplemental oxygen. And uh, the year before i had had pneumonia and pulmonary edema and had a lot of health issues. And so God definitely gave me strength on that day. But there's a lot of distraction. There's people dying, uh, people that had fallen to their death the night before. One guy came over to our tent as the sun had gone down and poked his head in. And he said, you guys, you're gonna have a hell of a time getting a blind guy up there. And then zipped it closed and walked off. And there's a, a body just steps away from our tent. Someone had, had died on the north side as well. Oh. And then another guy showed up with a camera and said, I wanna be the first person to film Eric's body being brought oh. off to the mountain. Oh my. Oh. And so people thought we were gonna die when we left home, but here we are at 26,000 feet and they're still kind of encouraging it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have to shut that out of your mind. Mm. And uh, honestly, um, it was a verse from Romans 8, 28, neither height nor depth nor anything mm -hmm. in all creation mm -hmm. can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And death wasn't the worst thing that could happen to me. It's not why I, I wanted to continue on, like, oh, you know, just throw my life away. But uh, I honestly felt it was possible. But I also knew that should it happen, I'm covered, um, that his love will still be with me. 
Now, lest we think that you are Superman, which, you know, you're sounding like you can do anything. You can, you know, faster than a, a speeding bullet. You really had a, a, a near-death experience just the year before didn't you? you? I did. You we, actually fell. Yeah, we were on a training climb in the Himalayas. It's a mountain called Amadablam, and it's steeper, it's more technical than Everest, but not as high. And we were there to see how we would do as a team, kind of put things together. And well, a storm came in and it pinned me and my friend Eric in a tent at 20,000 feet on the edge of a 2,000 foot cliff together for a week with no other teammates around, just the two of us. Well, after everyone came back up together, we pushed for the summit, we didn't make it, we had to turn around, that's a whole big story in itself, but actually part of our success. And then on the way down, I was getting close to my tent, I was exhausted, had spent all that time at altitude. Uh, steps away, I stepped on a rock on the edge of a 600 foot cliff, it shifted, and I was sent falling down that cliff. Well, 150 feet below, I landed on a ledge the size of this table right here, and just, Boom. <laughs> what are you thinking as you're going? Do you have time to process anything as you're falling? Well, I get asked that a lot. Okay. And so, uh, you know, I, <laughs> in that moment, uh, you don't really have time to think, but I was thinking, did these pants make me look fat? <laughs> no, that's no, we would, that's we would be thinking that. Not you. You would never think that. It's more like four letter words help, stop, grab. You yeah. know, yeah. you can imagine now, maybe were one you, other. Were you tied to anyone else at the time? Were you, like, are you guys all roped together there are and ropes, you fell? And or? We did climb on ropes most of the way up that peak, but as I got close to my tent, I unclipped, and oh. that's when it happened. Yeah. And uh, really, it was though I had landed right there in the hand of God, and he said, really? not today. Um, oh. I honestly felt that I had been surrounded by angels and that this was a bit of a miracle. Um, they threw a rope to me, my teammates, and with the help of a Sherpa, I was able to get back to the tent. That sent my body into shock. I got high-altitude pulmonary edema, had to get a helicopter rescue. I got home, it turned to pneumonia. I would spend a lot of time with my best friend and climbing partner, a guy named Joseph and he would die in a snowboarding accident just two months before Everest, and I was actually the one to go and find him out in the backcountry. And uh, it, it was really just messing with my head, yeah. my motivation uh, to go back and climb Everest as a part of this team. And something I certainly prayed through as that challenge neared. So how did you push through that? Because for a lot of people, that would have like taken you out. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. for me, Eric Ida said, you know what, enough. I don't have the energy, the stamina, the perseverance, even the courage or the will to climb again because mm -hmm. of the fall and my best friend dying. But what is, how did you push through to do it? I would say a lot of it was due to my friend and the way he lived his life. He was a, a great guy who encouraged me, who believed in me perhaps more than I believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And to honor him and uh, his friendship, that was a big part of it to, for me to even open those doors or push on those doors. I prayed about it and every single one opened wide up. That was like God saying, trust me. I'm not gonna promise you the summit, but uh, I want you to trust me. You know, your friend Joseph was such a spiritual friend and mentor in your life. And this book, although it's full of adventure, is really a spiritual journey. And I don't know, Anne, if one of your favorite people is one of the many fabulous quotes in here. Oswald Chambers said, <laughs> Pause for a moment. <laughs> My favorite devotional when it was first highest. Okay, proceed. <laughs> the mountaintop is not meant to teach us anything. It is meant to make us something. That must be your experience or you wouldn't have included it, Eric, in the book. Yeah, absolutely. It's one I had to think about for a little while. Then I thought about not just the mountain, but what it's a metaphor for in our lives and all the obstacles and all the difficult things we face. It's the loss of family members, of spouses. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a disease that, that has us in its grips or the economy or whatever it is. We all face obstacles. And, uh, you know, it might teach us something. As he says, it's not meant to teach us anything, but if we face those obstacles and we, we choose to, to hit them, head on, it certainly will make us something and it'll forge our character.